Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome to the MIT Energy Symposium for Tuesday, September 27th, 2022. I'm Dr. David Tuttle, and I'm substituting for Dr. Gary Payne. Our presentation today is Building a Molten Salt Reactor in Texas by 2025. But before I introduce our distinguished speakers, let me give you a preview of what is coming up next. Let's talk to it. On October 4th, our guest speaker is Gregor Stemino, Assistant Research Professor, Political Economy Research Institute and Department of Economics at University of Massachusetts Amherst. He will discuss stranded fossil fuel assets translate to major losses for investors in advanced economies. And then on October 11th, Dr. King has organized an Oxford style debate with sides arguing for and against university fossil fuel divestment. But the question, given the educational and research missions of universities, should university endowments divest investments from companies in the supply chain? So join us for that too. Today, we have two distinguished speakers. We have Dr. Derek Haas and Dr. Kevin Clarno of UT Austin, who are gonna describe their effort to build a molten salt research reactor in Texas by 2025. Let's give you some background. The Nuclear Energy Experimental Testing Research Alliance, NEXTRA, is a collaboration between Abilene Christian University, Texas A&M, Georgia Tech, and the University of Texas at Austin. And it's funded by Natura Resources LLC to design, license, build, and operate a molten salt reactor in Abilene, Texas by 2025. The molten salt research reactor will be the first liquid fuel molten salt reactor licensed by the US NRC Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Molten salt reactors have the potential to provide electricity, medical isotopes, and industrial process heat in a reactor design that's even safer and more flexible than existing nuclear reactors. The coolant from molten salt reactors provides heat at about 600 degrees C, which is 300 degrees C, higher than traditional water-cooled reactors. And that will increase efficiencies for electricity generation, hydrogen production, and desalination. The construction permit was just submitted last month to the NRC. This talk will cover the status and future of the project, as well as potential for parallel development and public engagement. And now let me give you some background about our two distinguished speakers. <clears throat> Dr. Derek Haas joined the faculty of UT Austin after eight years at Pacific National. Northwest National Labs, where he worked as a senior research engineer and the national security director. He earned his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees from UT Austin. His research interests focus on radiation detection for nuclear arms control, nonproliferation, and advanced reactor design and licensing. This includes the fundamental physics of radioactive decay processes, fission yields, environmental transport of radionuclides and detection techniques. His research is primarily experimental and uses the 1.1 megawatt Trigo Mark II reactor pickle at UT Austin. And then Dr. Kevin Clarno. Dr. Clarno is an associate professor in the Nuclear and Radiation Engineering Program and affiliate faculty in the Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences at UT Austin. He also holds a joint faculty appointment with Oak Ridge National Labs, where he previously worked for 15 years. Dr. Clarno is an expert at advanced nuclear modeling and simulation for both traditional and advanced nuclear reactors with specialization in radiation transport. And he has led multiple national, multi-institutional, high-performance computing research programs, including Consortium for Advanced Simulation of Light Water Reactors as interim director and the leader of the physics integration focus area, the modernization of the scale nuclear analysis software, and he also led the development of the advanced multi-physics fuel performance code 
and a portfolio of Oak Ridge Labs directed strategic research projects. So let's welcome our two speakers. We'll have a Q&A session after the presentations are completed and please online use the Q&A function in the chat. Thanks, Right, so I will rely on anybody online to let us know if we're not hearing uh, successfully. Uh, but I am Derek Haas. Thank you for the great introduction. Uh, Dave, he's kind of told us everything. You're going to tell, we're going to tell you the rest of the presentation. So we'll give you a little more detail. Um, I do want to stress that Kevin and I are here speaking on behalf of a very large uh, collaboration. So this is a group um, with Abilene Christian University, uh, Georgia Tech, Texas A&M, University of Texas, and we're all funded uh, by a private company called the Tour Resources. So um, many professors, students, staff uh, contributed to the work that we'll talk about today, and, um, and we're just here to take all the credit. Right, so it's the mouse. <laughs> um, so the goal of our collaboration is to solve energy, water, and medicine problems around the world. So we've bitten off a nice small problem to, to solve here. Um, we do understand, though, that because that set of problems is so large that you have to start small. And one of the key points of our program is that we're trying to start at a research reactor instead of going for, we're gonna build a thousand nuclear reactors in the next 10 years. Uh, maybe we can do that, probably not, but we wanna start small with something that's achievable and that we can help the rest of the world understand nuclear can be deployed, it can be deployed quickly, safely, and on budget. Uh, so with that, we started with a research reactor at a university. We have one here at the University of Texas. It's a light water reactor. It was commissioned in 1991 or 92, and it was the last university research reactor uh, to be commissioned in the United States. So um, many people in the audience here were not born then, and so our reactor is older than you are. Um, our goal is to go through that same process and create a research reactor at Abilene Christian University's campus here in Genesis. So I am uh, Kevin Clarno, appreciate you guys being here. Um, to give you a little perspective on nuclear reactors in the US, the US has around 100 nuclear reactors that are operating, uh, producing electricity. They all are of the traditional form, which is a solid fuel ceramic inside of a metal tube cooled with pressurized water. Um, they're located throughout the country. Um, and in addition, there are around 100 uh, naval uh, submarine and aircraft carrier uh, nuclear reactors that are operating uh, as part uh, of the America's fleet of nuclear reactors. So there are a whole lot of nuclear reactors that are out there and operating. Um, the two that are most recent um, are actually uh, Vogel 3 and 4 in Georgia. Um, and those two reactors should be coming online and producing uh, each about a gigawatt of electricity um, and contributing to, uh, to the grid uh, sometime in the next year uh, or two. Um, but there's a lot of what are called advanced nuclear reactors that are really in the works. Um, so all of these different locations here are already identified sites for advanced nuclear reactors. Um, the names are the names of the companies uh, effectively that are building it. Um, each one of these has a different uh, fuel form. New Scales is a small uh, uh, pressurized water reactor using traditional fuel. Um, the Marble reactor has a uh, hydride fuel, which is similar to the fuel that's in the UT nuclear reactor. Um, and there are metal fleet fuels and uh, other solid fuels called trisoparticles that um, have their own uh, very micro-coated uh, protection. And then there are two reactors uh, that are in the uh, planned stages that are 
molten salt fuel. And so in this type of fuel, instead of being a solid fuel inside of some solid protected sealed container, the fuel itself is liquid and is flowing throughout the system. So with those reactors, uh, there are also a variety of different coolants that are used. The traditional is pressurized water, and that's the new scale plan. Um, but there are a lot of high pressure helium, liquid metal, heat pipe, and uh, molten salt reactors that are used as coolant. Um, and so in this, uh, each of these different uh, companies is at a different stage in the licensing process. Many of these companies have 10, 15, 20 years of R&D and non-nuclear research, getting all of the pumps and the piping and the materials and all of those details worked out. Um, some of them are newer than that. Uh, some of them are targeted towards small military applications, while others are looking at sort of the larger electricity infra infrastructure. Um, but as far as the licensing status, the new scale reactor uh, followed one path, uh, which is the combined um, operating uh, design, uh, combined construction and operating license. Um, and so they followed that path and they have a design that has been reviewed, approved this design that they can build. All they need is a site for it. And they've identified a site at Idaho National Laboratory. Um, and so once they identify the site, they say, let's submit the permit to build on that site. Um, they get it constructed and they get an operating license to uh, operate it. Um, the Kairos and the Nextro reactors in uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee and Abilene um, have submitted their construction permit. And once that construction permit is approved, they're going to be able to start building. And once they've built, then they will be able to uh, show how they are going to operate this and have all of the detailed uh, specs as far as what is in the fuel, what is in the system, where is it operating, uh, to be able to get the operating license approved. So from a high level standpoint, the traditional light water reactor uh, has solid fuel. Um, and so inside of these fuel assemblies are composed of um, hundreds of nuclear fuel rods. Each nuclear fuel rod has a bunch of ceramic pellets of uh, uranium dioxide fuel, and it's sealed, and the coolant, the water flows in, and it flows past it, gets hot, flows out, goes generally through a heat exchanger to pass that energy to a secondary coolant that is used to produce electricity right away. Um, with the molten salt reactor, uh, you have kind of the inverted concept. The fuel is liquid salt, and it flows into a geometry and structure that has materials that allows the fission to happen. And with that fission happening in that region, it heats up that fuel salt and then flows out, goes through a heat exchanger, and there's a secondary coolant that flows past it to take that energy and produce whatever electricity uh, or uh, output application you want it for. And so this light water reactor, in order to get high efficiency, you need to have high temperatures. So you want it to be liquid at 300 degrees C. So they're generally pressurized to 15 MPa. And so you have a very large body of water at high pressure and high temperature. And what you don't want is you don't want any accident that's going to cause a pipe to break and all of that water to flash to steam. Because if you look, flash the steam, you suddenly pressurize whatever building it was sitting in, and you risk melting these fuel assemblies. And so the, the risk and the danger in a pressurized water reactor is that flash the steam and melt of the reactor, uh, melt of the fuel rods. So in order to prevent that, they have giant concrete domes that are designed to contain all of the pressure if that coolant suddenly uh, flashes to steam. And the radiation, if that fuel melts, they're trying to keep all that radiation inside of that protected building. Because if it starts to melt, then it's going to be able to release that radiation, especially with steam and uh, high pressure steam in there. So with the molten salt reactor, um, because it doesn't become liquid until 450, 475 C, uh, 
it is already at a very high elevated temperature in order to have it operating at 600 C. And it's atmospheric pressure. You don't need to pressurize it. And so since it is also already liquid fuel, in the worst case scenario, your reactor suddenly leaks all of this salt. It kind of goes to the bottom of the building. It already was liquid. It was already designed to handle that liquid. There is no large pressure release. And so you can operate with a building that has just a standard steel structure. Um, these reactors we put down in a trench to just protect the, uh, uh, the workers from the radiation dose. And so that ground around the trench is able to uh, protect the people and the public from that radiation. So fundamentally, from a safety standpoint, uh, there is a whole lot more built-in inherent safety in this type of a reactor. So from a concept of how does this, how is this used to produce energy? Where do we get this? In that molten salt reactor, we have the fuel salt that is flowing in a loop and going through a heat exchanger, and the you have a coolant salt. And so this coolant salt, you have a big, large coolant storage tank, and you pump it through the heat exchanger to cool off that primary, and you fill up your energy storage tank. So here you have a large energy storage salt tank, and whenever you want to use that energy, whether to generate electricity, desalination, hydrogen generation, industrial heat, you use that energy, you pump the salt back into the coolant storage, and you can just flow through that loop. As long as you have sufficient coolant in your coolant storage, you can operate your reactor. If you start realize you're running low on coolant, you have a critical level and you say, let's turn the reactor off. Um, meanwhile, your fuel is liquid and it is in a fully isolated sealed loop. It's not interacting with the rest of this salt that is flowing through as coolant. Um, but if you want, you can take samples out of that flowing salt. Since it's liquid, you can reach in, you can grab some out and take it out and separate out the radioisotopes. Because within that fuel, with the fission happening, you are producing all kinds of radioisotopes that are useful for medical industrial purposes but it, you, are, you are also, uh, especially with a thorium fuel cycle, you can put thorium in this reactor and you can generate new uranium that is used as nuclear fuel. And so through this process, you can design a fully sustainable uh, nuclear energy fuel cycle. Um, in addition, uh, if you remove the oxygen, which is corrosive, you remove the oxygen from that traditional nuclear fuel, then you can take that spent fuel from the traditional reactors and put it inside of these molten salt reactors and you can start to burn and eliminate that nuclear waste. So from a conceptual standpoint, there's a lot of benefits to these molten salt reactors over the traditional reactors, which are just producing electricity that is not varying on demand. It is baseload electricity power. Um, and so uh, from that standpoint, there's, there's a lot of benefit and opportunity. So the reactor that we're working on is built on a proven technology. So in the, in the 1950s and 1960s, there were four different molten salt reactors built. Uh, the first three were for the military and the third, let's see if I get that out of the way, maybe not that way. Uh, the, the fourth was the molten salt reactor experiment, which operated from 1965 to 1969 at Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, it operated safely. It was effective. They demonstrated the technology, the materials, um, and the safety of the system. So this is a proven technology that, that can be built and has been built. So the Nextra Alliance... Okay. The Nextra Alliance uh, is this collaboration uh, between uh, Natura Resources, Abilene, Texas A&M, Texas, and Georgia Tech. Uh, this really came about as a Texas-focused initiative. Um, in Abilene, they had the idea and the vision for this, and they said, we want to make this happen, but we don't have the expertise all by ourselves. Uh, we need to reach out to the leading institutions in Texas, and uh, one of the professors here at UT left for Georgia Tech soon after that discussion started happening. So it's a Texas initiative with Georgia Tech. Um, the current funding uh, is uh, over $30 million plus 
Uh, DOE Office of Nuclear Energy has pitched in uh, with support from the NEDP program through grants and game vouchers. And there are over 150 people that are currently participating in this design and licensing process. All right, so um, we've laid out a few of the key goals of this project here. So we want to demonstrate licensing, uh, develop that advanced reactor licensing experience because the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has spent its entire existence licensing traditional light water reactors. They're very good at that, and uh, that's what they know how to do. They're being asked now to license a whole new type of reactor, and not just one type, but all of those different types of reactors that Kevin talked about. Uh, so um, luckily, that is going to be a you know, collaborative uh, experience for everybody because we're designing the reactors and we're communicating with the regulators about what we are finding through the design process. They're asking questions. And so um, uh, that's part of what we're trying to do with this research reactor. And the other part of doing it as a research reactor is to drive down some of the costs um, with going with a very large commercial reactor. So another goal would be to establish an initial supply chain. So build this first reactor, identify what parts are commercially available, um, hence not many, uh, and find out how we can contact suppliers and start developing those supply chains. Uh, we're also going to generate operational data at very low powers. So uh, one of the key points about a research reactor is it's uh, inherently very safe. So it's a long way away from any kind of accident that could harm the public. And that allows us to get some of this data that would help to scale up to larger reactors. We want to demonstrate that molten salt chemistry management. That's one of the key points and the key unknown uh, values in um, how we operate a molten salt reactor. We want to qualify the nuclear software that we're using to predict how the reactor will work. And then we want to understand the material accountability challenges. So you're going to have this fuel traditionally in a nuclear reactor. If you want to keep track of your uranium and plutonium, you go and count fuel rods and you have a document that says how long that fuel runs in the reactor. We know about how much mass of uranium and plutonium are in there, and it's pretty easy. So you keep them locked up and you count them. Now, instead of having physical uh, fuel rods, you've got um, a liquid. And so there's a whole new set of challenges in trying to say uh, how much is there in any given volume uh, of the reactor space. So those are our main goals in the, the project of the research reactor itself. Um, playing out what our research reactor looks like. So this is a conceptual design. We're moving on. We've moved on now to more uh, realistic designs that are actually to scale. But the key point here is that we are basing this off of that reactor from the 60s that Kevin talked about. Um, that molten salt reactor experiment used uranium fluoride, lithium fluoride, beryllium fluoride as the fuel salt. Uh, it had a loop design, which is what we're continuing with, a graphite moderator uh, to slow down the neutrons, and then it had a drain tank for any kind of accident scenario. So if things were not happening the way you want them to happen, the idea is the fuel drains out of the reactor into a drain tank where the reaction shuts down, everything is allowed to reset, and you can assess what went wrong and, and try to restart the reactor. Uh, it's also a trench-based design so that uh, the reactor is down here, again, shielding that radiation that's coming off the fission reaction. A few of the changes that we've made in the molten salt research reactor at the top is we're going to a high assay, low enriched uranium. So the MSRE ran off high enriched uranium at 33% U-235. Uh, we scaled that back so that we don't have any HEU. It really helps with the paperwork. Um, we've also scaled back the power to one megawatt thermal instead of eight megawatts thermal uh, in the MSRE. We're using stainless steel 316 instead of um, an alloy called Hastelloy N as the structural material. And so the Hastelloy N was a material that was found to be very resistant to corrosion uh, from molten salts. And stainless steel 316 was good, it was just that Hastelloy N was better. And so uh, um, we can still get the data we need with a shorter lived reactor and avoid that has to weigh in. Uh, we won't have a requirement in order to operate 
to pull off radioactive gases like was done in MSRE. We're actually going to do that as an experiment so that we can gather data from that, but it's not required to operate. And uh, we'll also be utilizing 50 years of other technology advancement. So better understanding of the chemistry management in a molten salt, how to avoid that corrosion that we were talking about uh, with the stainless steel 316, um, computer models, which is Kevin's area of expertise, so I won't even try to get into that. And so why a university research reactor? So um, a lot of the other companies are going straight towards a either a commercial power plant or um, a privately owned and operated uh, research reactor or test reactor. So um, in the molten salt space, we definitely have uncertainties in some of the values that we need in order to license a full power plant. Um, some of the things that we've already talked about. So we need that experience no matter what. Um, and so then going to research route makes a lot of sense. Instead of doing lots of lab-based experiments and trying to extrapolate that up to a full-scale power reactor, we're gonna go ahead and bootstrap our way by doing a, a research reactor, get some of that data, and then um, that will be a lot more effective in proving to regulators that we have the data we need to ensure a safe operation. So the other part about university research reactors is that fuel and waste issues are simplified from a um, you know, from the perspective of getting this thing up and running. So the Department of Energy has an office uh, inside the Office of Nuclear Energy, the Research Reactor Initiative. Uh, that project provides fuel to the university research reactors that are in existence all around the country, including ours here at UT. And it owns the fuel for the lifetime of the reactor. So they provide the fuel, they own the fuel while it's here at the research reactor, and then they own it uh, when the reactor is decommissioned. Uh, they've also provided the transportation of fresh fuel and remo removal of uh, spec fuel, both you know, to keep it running and when the reactor is um, shut down. So um, that project is set up so that one, students get to train on research reactors. Um, we actually have a graduate level class here at UT where students come in, they operate under the um, advice of the licensed reactor operator. And part of your class is you get to run a nuclear reactor. I took that class as a grad student. It was the last time I did operate the reactor, but, uh, but it, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity. So that is what this provides to universities. It also makes sure that the reactors are available to provide data and experimental capabilities around the country. So we're engaged with the uh, Office of Nuclear Energy uh, to try to get into that program. Uh, the other process here is that licensing with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is simplified. So if you go for a power reactor, especially a high uh, power output reactor, the licensing process is very long. It is uh, incredibly intense uh, to try to make sure that everything is operated so that the public is uh, kept safe. Research reactors at low powers are specifically targeted to be able to gather that data with very low exposure to the public. So um, just the uh, amount of radioactive material that's created that could get out is linear related to the um, reactor power. So dropping that reactor power uh, from, let's say, 3,000 megawatt thermal down to one megawatt thermal is going to reduce that risk by a factor of 3,000. So it lets you um, design the reactor in such a way and license the reactor in such a way that uh, you're taking advantage of that reduced risk. Uh, so this is the website for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Anybody that's interested, they have a separate site for each of these projects that we've mentioned. And this is the ACU site. Um, the main thing there is that you can keep up with all of the processes. Everybody's submitting their pre-licensing engagement, their construction permits, things like that. It's all uh, available there from the NRC. And so what does a license effort application look like? So this is the cover of our recently submitted um, preliminary safety analysis report, PSAR. This is the main document in the construction permit. The other document is a letter saying, we intend to build a reactor and we'd like to request a construction permit. So. The construction permit itself is 611 pages. It covers the design of the reactor, the operational constraints, 
the design criteria and standards that will be used to build the reactor, uh, description of the location where it will be deployed, the analysis of any potential accidents, and then an evaluation of the impacts from those accidents, as well as an environmental review on any impacts that the reactor construction and operation decommissioning may have on the environment. So it's a beefy document. And probably the most important part about this process for us has been that we have had the back and forth with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission while we've been developing the document. So um, in the past, engagements with the regulator has been of the type that you write a document, you throw it over the fence to the regulator, the regulator looks at it, sends back official questions, you try to answer the questions to the best of your ability, and that goes back, and it's this constant, very long timeline, you know, this is a month for each step to go back and forth. And so we're trying to uh, speed that up a bit. And so we feel like we've taken advantage of that and put together a solid construction permit to build this reactor. So what does it look like? Um, this is the architectural design from the, the company that's building the uh, Science and Engineering Research Center at Abilene. And um, one of the key features here is that the way the uh, regulations are currently laid out, you can build a building that you would like to one day put a nuclear reactor in, and you don't have to get a license to build a building, but if you build the building incorrectly, you have to change something, then you're on the hook for that change. Um, then you can apply it for a license to build the reactor inside that building. So that's the path we're taking here. And, um, ACU has broken ground in this building, and we've submitted that construction permit to install the reactor in a building. So um, that's another way that we're trying to streamline the processes to get results more quickly. A little timeline at the top here. So um, the next lab was formed at ACU in 2016. In uh, 2018, they received a $3.5 million donation to get this research stood up. In 2020, the consortium was formed where ACU brought in uh, other professors and, and staff from UT a and and Georgia Tech, and we were funded. And so then construction started on the, this building here that will house the reactor this year, and we submitted our construction permit this year. We are aiming for our operational license and first criticality in 2025. And then as we're going through these next steps, we're hoping to help out with some of the commercial activity, commercialization activities. So we're designing a research reactor. What does a commercial reactor look like that builds off of this first one? We do have city, state, and federal support. So the city of Abilene has contributed to this project. Um, the state of Texas passed uh, resolutions in support of the project here. And then we've also engaged with both the uh, Department of Energy and U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, you've probably seen in a lot of policy and bills that have been passed lately is that nuclear is now back in fashion. And so um, we're hoping that we have hit this at the perfect time uh, to take advantage of a lot of the, the drivers out there in the funding. So a little bit of details about the Science and Engineering Research uh, Center. It is 28,000 square feet with a 6,000 square foot research bay. It has some specialty research labs to support gathering that data that we talked about. Um, has some offices and um, like I mentioned, we are in the construction phase. So when we talk to the nuclear community, this next slide always makes everybody real excited because in the nuclear community, building something is a big step that we rarely get to, to reach. Uh, most of the time you design a reactor and then you move on to the next project. Um, we've actually broken ground here. So this is ACU's campus. They have um, started digging the trench there. Um, I will also mention a couple of things about this. So there's your trench. We're gonna install um, piers to support a very um, heavy, trench floor there, and then they put, build up the walls around that. And then once it comes to the surface, they backfill around the trench and pour the slab for the rest of the building. 
This is right across the street from ACU's campus. Uh, they're actually absorbing this lot into their um, campus, and it is the site of a former elementary school. So um, uh, the Abilene School District moved out of the school. ACU purchased the site from uh, the school district, and the uh, school gym is actually being turned into some radiochemistry labs to support this work. <laughs> So that's about where we are today. Uh, we've got the trench walls poured. The reactor would drop in here uh, with the use of a crane, and then we'll add all the ancillary equipment around it. All right, so what's our path forward? We've got a construction permit submitted. We need that construction permit to be approved. While that is going through the approvals process, we're working on a detailed design of the reactor systems, testing some of the subsystems in a non-nuclear fashion, so molten salt loops without nuclear fuel, um, a non-nuclear test bed, so try to recreate this design of the reactor without fuel in it, run that and try to identify any problems before we add the uranium. We're continuing our modeling, um, doing a security system design for this reactor, as I mentioned, that is one of the things that we will need to develop as part of this project. And then there's construction uh, staff training for people to be able to operate this reactor. We'll be submitting a, an operations license that will let us actually fuel it and turn on. And then we will achieve criticality and then operate the reactor to get the data we're looking for. So um, while our construction permit we feel like it was a big step. There's still a lot of work left to do. So we're also talking about trying to transition this technology to a commercial reactor. So what we need to make that make sense is we need to understand the economics, the costs and the demand out there. We need higher power. One megawatt is good, but we'd rather target something in the hundreds of megawatts. Uh, we need modularity so that these can be factory built. We're trying to avoid some of the problems that have happened with traditional nuclear reactors and their build timelines. Uh, flexibility regarding replacement and upgrades of components and maybe even the whole reactor. And then we also need a clear licensing pathway. And what we get from the research reactor is a better understanding of costs. It doesn't clear everything up, but it does give us a better understanding. We get data on isotope retention. So this is where the radioactive materials are in that salt. And we need to know what fraction of them get out into the environment. For a construction permit, we've assumed that 100% of the most mobile radiation flights get out. And we think that is a very conservative assumption. Uh, what it does is it lets us build the reactor with a very conservative assumption. But if we can get real data on that, and that's a significantly lower number, now we can scale up the reactor power significantly. We have uh, an opportunity to identify those supply chain bottlenecks, things like pumps that work in a 650 degree molten salt, and, uh, temperature sensors and things like that. We will be refining that fuel chemistry process that will aid in the licensing pathway. We'll gather data that we need for code validation. And then we will also demonstrate that licensing pathway with a research reactor. So that the idea is then you just scale up for a power reactor and do the additional um, licensing and calculations needed for that commercial year. So a uh, research reactor is not operated at all like the power reactor. The power reactor, um, nuclear reactors, you want to turn them on, get them at full power and leave them at full power as long as you can. In uh, traditional light water reactors, they operate for 18 months or two years before they ramp back down in power, shut down for a week or two, refuel, do maintenance, turn back on and stay on for another 18 to 24 months. Um, and so, uh, but, but a university research reactor doesn't behave like that. It's designed to build understanding and intuition. It's designed to teach people how to re operate the reactor. And so in many ways, a research reactor can go through a whole lot more transient scenarios. They go through a lot more, turn the reactor on, shut the reactor off. Let's see what happens if we 
move control rods up and down. Let's see what happens when we change different things. And so with that, the University Re Research Reactor provides a lot more fundamental data about what will happen inside of a reactor as it's operating, not just in normal mode, but in a lot of the uh, anticipated transients and accident type modes. Um, so one of the challenges that has plagued the nuclear industry is, is really design stagnation. In the very early years of nuclear, there were lots of people doing lots of different designs and Westinghouse had their PWR and every new person that wanted to build one, they said, oh, I, you know, I can tweak this piece, I can tweak that piece. And they were trying to innovate while they were designing it. And so they were able to add lots of innovation, but then they found that they had lots of different reactors and everyone was unique and it became difficult to manage. So they started saying, let's completely fix the design. And what wound up happening is they fixed the design and it didn't change. Um, but the sort of fundamental concept of these light water reactors um, in the 1950s and 1960s, they had uranium dioxide ceramic fuel inside of metal tubes with pressurized water flowing past it. The ones that are being built in Georgia today, exact same thing, the exact same sort of fundamental concept. It made it very difficult to innovate in nuclear. If you aren't building them very often because you're building 3000 gigawatt thermal uh, reactors, you don't need a lot of them often. and uh, when the licensing process gets to be very difficult and onerous, you fix something, you stick with it, and you say, I'm not gonna change it for 50 years. Um, we have to resist that design stagnation. And so the, the concern is if we build one of these molten salt reactors and we say, let's scale it up to commercial, how are we going to enable ourselves to continue to innovate and improve and optimize these designs. And that's gonna require integrating simulation. Um, so the software that we're working with needs to be or become predictive. Um, it needs to incorporate all of the coupled multi-physics. It needs to uh, incorporate all of the multi-scale chemistry, material performance, corrosion issues in normal operation and, and accidents and planned transients. So uh, incorporating into this system uh, a suite of digital twins will really enable us to be able to have that integrated, pull the data off real time from the reactor uh, for various components and the system as a whole, and process that data, understand what it's saying, look to see what it can tell us about how it's operating, where it might be failing, and seeing what we can learn from it. So we can on one hand, just fundamentally be able to communicate to the regulator, we are always operating within our design specs. We always have this much margin between our, where we're operating and failure. Um, and so we can always consistently, uh, persistently communicate that we are conforming to that regulatory requirements. Um, but we can also take a look at individual components, the individual pumps and heat exchangers, and the radioactive gas that we're pulling off, um, how can we understand and optimize and improve those systems better? And with this design that has a loop where the salt flows into the bottom of the reactor, flows through where there are those moderating materials that allows the fission to happen in the middle, goes up into the top, there is a experimental access tank where we can uh, put different materials to be able to test how do things behave, where we're able to pull off the radioactive gases and see what's in them and see, uh, pull out salt pieces of the salt, samples of the salt to understand what is the composition of that salt. Um, as it flows through the primary pump and the heat exchanger and then back into the core, um, conceptually, we can see how we can take this same design and say, we don't have to build an entire brand new reactor. We can individually optimize components and the next version, let's replace, let's get a better performing component for this one or for that. Um, and understanding the integrated effects. Uh, all of the physics in this, we have radiation transport, we have materials changing through fission, through corrosion, we have heat transfer, all of it is fundamentally coupled and transferred. And so understanding how that full system operates and integrates together um, is something that we need to make sure we're able to communicate because 
if we don't understand it on a one megawatt university research reactor as students are operating it, we're not going to be able to convince the regulator or the public that we understand how it behaves when we have a full large scaled up system for powers. Um, and also being able to predict maintenance, um, especially with high temperature salts uh, with these metals. We know that corrosion is going to be happening. We have chemistry controls to try to manage it. Um, but we need to be able to start predicting when we need to shut down for maintenance. In the existing reactors, they have decades of experience that has shown how long can I operate before I need to do certain maintenance. Um, with these systems, we, we're not sure. Uh, we need to build that understanding and experience. And so by having really well instrumented systems um, and being able to pull that data off and do the modeling simulation and process that data, hopefully we're going to be able to get that uh, predictive nature and understanding the maintenance. And so this will really enable us uh, to have more flexibility in our designs, to allow the designs to innovate with time, to upgrade components uh, as we progress uh, over the next coming decade. Um, we can also start to look at application specific designs. Um, and so when we look at what, what could we do with this? So we said it is 600, 650 Celsius uh, high temperature liquid salt. Um, so with that 650 C, we can use that for high efficiency electricity generation. Right now in our ranking cycle, we're working with 300 C um, uh, steam. Uh, 650 C, there's a lot of other things that can be done. Uh, there are a lot of industrial heat applications, uh, hydrogen generation, chemical plants, that kind of thing. Um, the waste heat that comes out even after the 650 C, as you're trying to cool that off, there's gonna be some more heat. That heat can be used for seawater desalination, um, uh, produced water cleanup from uh, oil and gas industry. And by uh, taking cold salt from a cold salt storage tank to a hot energy storage tank, tank, you allow yourself the ability to provide the electricity when you need it. The existing reactors, they go straight to pr producing steam and turning a turbine. But this allows you to pull off that energy, pull off that heat to run the turbine when you want. So right now it can be, um, uh, follow where the need is. And when other energy systems aren't providing what's needed to cover the market, uh, this can follow that load. And then there's lots of reactor applications that can come. So mentioned isotope production. Uh, we can feed thorium into this type of reactor and start producing fissile materials. We're producing more uranium than we're using. And we have a sustainable nuclear energy fuel cycle. Um, we can burn the long-lived nuclear waste uh, to fundamentally reduce the volume of radioactive waste that would need to go to final disposal. Um, and we can generate isotopes for other purposes, the medical industry and the uh, industrial application. There are lots of uses for radioactive isotopes. And since this is already a liquid fuel, it is already easier to pull off because in the traditional nuclear reactors, you have a solid fuel that you're going to have to take and separate and chop up in order to get those isotopes. But by it already being liquid, it's easier to pull those off. For a second. And I just have one final pitch here. So our consortium is often hiring. We have uh, open faculty positions at the University of Texas in the nuclear program as part of the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And Georgia Tech also, also has a couple of open faculty positions in nuclear. Um, ACU often has staff positions open for work specifically on this. So I just wanted to throw that out there as well. And, uh, we'll open it up to questions. Well, while you're thinking about there's one online. Um, could you speak to the water needs? Of both the, the light water reactor and the molten salt reactor, for example, you know what, how much water do you need? How does it help the challenge when you're in an area that has drought conditions? So, quantity-wise, um, I don't have an answer for that. Um, uh, the traditional uh, commercial reactors all tend to be 
sitting next to a large river or a lake where they have their own reservoirs. Um, they will pull that water off. So they, it'll turn the turbine, go through the ranking cycle, make the electricity, and then they have to cool that water before it cycles back in. So that they're pulling off the water from uh, the public systems and they either send it through an evaporator or put it hotter back into the lake or the river. Um, the quantity of that water, I'm not sure. It's mostly site specific. So um, one of the other um, aspects is that if you know now if you're going out and building reactors that you will have water restrictions at a particular site, it's less efficient to use air cooling, but it is possible. And you just need to develop your systems around that. Uh, and then that's one of the areas where being more efficient in energy production with an advanced reactor allows you to lose a little bit of efficiency in cooling your, uh, your electricity production systems. So, any idea? I, I don't have an idea. Is it necessarily naturally more water intensive or less than a traditional water? Do we have I think it's more than part of what you learn. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so in traditional reactors, reactors, um, it's about ten thousand years for the fuel to degrade or give its half life, so it's safe. So, is your reactor? And maybe you talk about this, and I just completely miss it. But do y'all take the reactions further to the point where it's, it's the life of the fuel at the end um, takes less time to degrade, or is it still the uh, plutonium risks that? <laughs> so in in all spent in, in all nuclear reactors, um, when you're fissioning uranium, uh, your uranium that you pull out of the ground is about 0.7 percent uranium 235. That's the good stuff, and 99.3 percent uranium 238. And so we enrich it to get it to about 5 percent uranium 235. There's still a lot of that uranium 238. And when it catches a neutron, it will actually produce plutonium-239, which can fission just like uranium. So it can act as fuel, but it can also continue catching neutrons and getting heavier and heavier. And um, so when we, in the current fleet of reactors, after the fuel has been in there for maybe four and a half, six years, uh, they pull that fuel out, they let it cool in a uh, spent, uh, spent fuel storage pool for about five years. And then they'll just put it into an air-cooled uh, concrete cask. And in there, the fuel is fundamentally becoming less radioactive. Um, it, it is uh, reducing the amount of heat that it's generating. Um, it, lots of these radioactive fission products are decaying away and going away. But there are some that are very long-lived, like the uranium itself, uh, which has um, thousands of year, millennia half-life. Um, some of these other isotopes, like the plutoniums and amories, have um, hundreds of thousands of year half life. And so, um, just like that uranium you dug out of the ground, it is going to stay radioactive for a long time. And you have to decide what you're going to do with it. Um, with it in the sealed metal tubes for the light water reactors, they just say, let's keep it in that fuel. But we need to keep an eye on it to understand uh, and make sure it isn't leaking into the water supply and that kind of thing. With this type of reactor, um, we still have to make sure we're aware of that. We're still producing those isotopes. Um, they can be designed in a way that we are net destroying them. Um, and so you can overall be reducing the nation's quantity of those long-lived isotopes. Uh, because when you fold them into this reactor, um, they can still fission, they can still produce heat. And because you have the continuous mixing, because the fuel is a liquid, it isn't like the traditional reactors where it was stuck in one place and it built in. And now they said, you know, we've, we've generated so much more of these fissure products and we've burned some of the fuel that we have to take this fuel and call it waste. Um, here we can continue to irradiate it to burn off a lot of those isotopes. I would also say that we, we do have the opportunity to uh, develop a thorium to uranium 233 fuel cycle which also doesn't produce those very long-lived tax benefits. Yeah, we can remove the uranium-238 and just work with the thorium and U-233. We don't produce this. You have a question right there? Yeah. You mentioned that traditional reactors are using a damp ranking cycle, uh, but y'all have more flexibility at a higher temperature. Uh, what's gonna handle the power generation side of this? <laughs> we don't know yet. So, um, 
So the, the question was, uh, are we using a Rankine cycle or something else? Um, so we do have the opportunity to go with uh, newer advanced designs like supercritical scope two. There's a demonstrator out there. Um, and uh, we're interested in that kind of technology. We're also interested in potentially using helium as a coolant, a final coolant to drive a generator. Um, and so the main item there is you can just operate at you know dramatically higher efficiencies and potentially 50% more efficient per unit of thermal energy. So, um, so there's definitely some targets out there. I will say that as we are developing this, we're focused on a nuclear reactor. Um, we want to get this proven, demonstrated, turned on, and um, and so we're not developing those systems. We are happy to have discussions with folks who are, um, and then whichever of those technologies prove to be uh, a best fit and are actually working, we definitely get the wrong. Are you limited away from Rankin cycles because of the temperature? Is it too hot? Not necessarily. Yeah. Just yeah. Yeah, no, it's not necessarily too hot for Rankin cycle. But to clarify, the um, the molten salt research reactor is generating one megawatt of heat and it is just going to be um, air cooled released to the air. We're not using that one megawatt of heat for any purpose. Any other questions? Got one online. What's the operational lifetime of the demo reactor? The uh, it is being licensed um, to operate for five effective full power years. Um, the molten salt reactor experiment operated for five years, so we feel confident and comfortable that it's been demonstrated to go for five years. We can do five years also, um, but that's something that we're going to monitor and um, and and understand how it works and how it behaves as we track that chemistry. But the intention is for it to be a relatively short-lived reactor. Was there one back? Yeah, I was going to ask, why would you let the the energy just like dissipate in the air? Why would you use that? Much? It's very expensive, and this is already an expensive uh, project. So it really is just about efficiency. So. Um, there's also a matter of it changes the licensing. So even a one megawatt reactor, if you're producing commercial power for that, um, with that reactor, you have to go through a different licensing path that is much more onerous. And so um, that's a big part of it. There are plans out there for other universities to take designs that, um, you know, other advanced reactor designs. So the University of Illinois is interested in powering part of their campus. Um, if the University of Texas was interested, that's something that could be done here as well, as we could replace our uh, natural gas power power plants with nuclear power. Um, are they, um, right now, other universities are more interested in that than, than our university. So, so you mentioned Hass alloy and stainless steel 316. Are those the only new materials you really need, or are there new ones that have to be invented? So stainless steel 316 is quali a qualified nuclear material. And so the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has looked at it, as uh, so ASME has looked at it and said, this is qualified for nuclear reactors. Haspaloy N hasn't been, and that's one of the reasons why we're using the stainless steel instead of Haspaloy. Um, but long-term, we know that there um, are more corrosion resistant things out there uh, that would be better. And one of the reasons for having a research reactor is so we can take some of those materials and put them in this irradiated fuel salt to understand their corrosion, their lifetime properties, to be able to generate the data that would qualify these materials to be used in a future reactor. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so you said that they had a molten salt reactor experiment in the 60s. Why have there not really been any molten salt reactors since then? <laughs> so, um, in this, so in the early days of nuclear energy, um, the commercial industry was trying to make electricity at the same time that the military side was trying to propel our uh, vehicles. And from their standpoint, there was a clear need for something that was structurally stable in case the boat rock. Um, and they're very comfortable with water. And so they were consistently leaning towards the solid fuel and water cooled reactors. Um, uh, 
The next generation that was supposed to follow the molten salt reactor experiment was the molten salt breeder reactor. And that reactor was designed to produce more uh, fuel than it was using. It was supposed to be breeding new fissile material. Um, and in the 70s, they decided that um, they didn't want to start pursuing breeding new fuel. Uh, and it had more to do with international politics than it had to do with what were the domestic Uh, what what was the energy produced from the MSRE in the 60s? It was an eight megawatt thermal reactor. Um, it did the same as the, uh, the MSRR will. It just dumped its heat. It wasn't used for any production. Is it that uh, that the same thing that you mentioned that there are two salt molten salt reactors? So that one in the 60s is the other MSR. So the, yeah, the molten salt reactor uh, experiment in the 1960s operated five years. There were three before that that were part of the aircraft reactor experiment. Um, they were looking at nuclear reactors to power aircraft. We have some questions, I think. How long, uh, I mean, knowing, I know that you don't, you don't know what you don't know yet, but um, the way to a, uh, what does that look like? Uh, is it a gas unit or do you have sort of a... I don't, think we're, I don't think we're prepared to give a number on that. Yeah. Um, I will say that um, we definitely don't want this to be a step-by-step -step process. We want to do these things in parallel. And so while we are working on getting this reactor turned on, there is a parallel effort to, to design a, a commercial system so that a first generation of commercial systems could be with them. So, yeah. I, that's the best way I can answer. Yeah, and, and a lot of it has to do with um, where the market would lead. Um, is there a market for a one or five megawatt reactor that has a specific purpose, perhaps? Um, it, and if that's the case, then you could take what we're doing now and convert it pretty easily. Is the market at 250 megawatts? That may take another research reactor. Um, and so, you know, from that standpoint, it's really, you know, where does the market develop as we start to prove that this can be done? And I'll also mention that uh, DOE came out with a study just a week or two ago about replacing uh, coal generating uh, power plants with nuclear reactors, just dropping small modular reactors in. Uh, that's a particularly encouraging opportunity uh, just because the power lines are already there. A lot of the workers were already there that would that are trained on working on a power plant. Uh, you just need to retrain to work at a nuclear plant um, and then bring in a few nuclear specific uh, staff members. Um, what's changed? Can you describe what's changed at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission? Has there really been a, a transformational shift that makes new technologies much more welcomed and and um, so there have been some uh, bills passed uh, encouraging the NRC to uh, be more flexible, to uh, work with developers to look at new technologies and not stick to only light water reactors. Um, I don't know specifically what's changed, but I can't say that I've seen it. So uh, I'm on the reactor oversight committee that Kevin chairs, where we oversee the operations of our research reactor here at UT. Um, and the history of the NRC interactions on that reactor are significantly slower and um, less collaborative than what we're experiencing in the licensing of this advanced reactor. So um, something has certainly changed. I think there's a, a reality that these are coming. And so um, in, in 2000, when the Gen 4 initiative in nuclear said, look at all these possible reactors that might come someday, it was just conceptual. And so the NRC didn't really have to do a whole lot to prepare for it because it was, yeah, maybe. Um, but now, as you see that list of all of these people that are saying, I'm building a reactor, and this is where I'm building it. The NRC is understanding they need to be responsive. They need to be ready because this is real. And uh, they recognize that there is a lot to be learned together. Um, because the, the idea of you put together your package, you throw it over the fence, works if they know what to expect that they're going to receive 
and you know what they should be expecting. But right now, there is really a learning together process on what's here. And so it's regulatory oversight, um, but they're building up their understanding of what does this mean? Because fundamentally, you don't have high pressure water. And now you have this salt that is going to solidify instead of a fuel that you're afraid will melt. And so it's sort of like everything's kind of different and we need to work on this together. Um, and so um, I, I think it's the, the reality that these are coming that has kind of adjusted that perspective. And this will be mostly targeted probably as SMRs that can ramp in firm renewables. Yes, I think they'll be almost certain, almost specifically targeted as SMRs, so between 10 and 250 megawatt uh, thermal. Um, I think they have the capacity to ramp and uh, sure, you know, renewables. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily what the ideal deployment would be. So because of that high temperature, you wouldn't want to necessarily ramp the reactor power output, you would just divert it. And so with the molten salt energy storage, you keep the reactor running at full power as much as you can, and then divert that high temperature salt to electricity production when demand is high, divert it over to hydrogen production or desalination when demand is not high. So that's the way I would, I would lay that out. And, and for those who aren't familiar with the terminology, FMR is small modular reactor. So the traditional light water reactors are 3000 megawatt thermal, 1000 megawatt electric. And so small is in the um, you know twenties to hundreds of megawatt electric and modular. Uh, the reactors are being built in Georgia. Um, a lot of that facility is all built on site. Um, they bring in large pieces, uh, but a lot of it is an on site build. And so the idea with the modularity is if we make them smaller, we make them a size that you can put on the back of a uh, a train car or a truck bed, and you can take it wide load down the street, down the street, and just install it in place. And so you can have higher quality assurance um, with a factory type bit. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the day when we have nuclear reactors sharing the highway with the wind turbines. <laughs> okay, we've got one more question online. Anything here? Um, could we see this technology be applied to nuclear space propulsion? For those unfamiliar with it, when nuclear energy is used in conjunction with hydrogen as a working fluid to power a spacecraft. Um, probably a liquid fuel is not best designed for a lot of the um, space reactor propulsion concepts, um, but it would be a cool, interesting design project we can consider. Um, uh, a lot of, uh, one of the uh, solid fuel designs, uh, these triso particles are really well suited uh, for that. Um, and, and metal fuels can work very well for that also. Um, but this probably isn't the best design for that, but it could be. Great. So with that, why don't we thank our 